Today we are going to talk about a very important subject. Uh, you'll be able to understand it better if you were here last time. Uh, how many of you were not present last time? Uh, this is a series of talks uh, where it's a gradual process of uh, explaining the teachings of Buddha. And if you missed the earlier part, then uh, uh, it will be a little uh, difficult for you to understand everything, but you might be able to understand something, at least. Huh? Uh, today, there is a lot of interest in United States and also in uh, Canada and even Europe about this thing called Enlightenment. They have started a new magazine. Some of you may have seen this. It's called What is Enlightenment? That's the name of the magazine. And a lot of uh, uh, writers, philosophers, modern philosophers, uh, Buddhist students of Buddhism and students of uh, all religions uh, have been uh, uh, writing articles to this magazine. It's not only just students, it's professors are also writing. <laughs> so it has become a, a great interest in the West, because when we speak of the Buddha, that word Buddha means, some people translate it as the enlightened one. Of course, I translate that as the awakened one. It's not just enlightenment, it is awakening. Like if you are all sleeping here, and someone comes and switches on the light. That doesn't make much of a difference because you are still, you may not be in the dark outside, but because your eyes are not open, you are not awakened. So the first thing is switching on the lights and then later you have to gradually awaken so that Awakening is the important thing, but it starts with the enlightenment. So the enlightenment really means uh, an intellectual understanding of the problem of existence. That's how I Existence is a problem which people don't know. People normally begin to celebrate birthdays. Why do they celebrate birthdays? They think to be born is a great thing and they are very happy that there is a birth taken place. But from this Buddhist way of thinking, to be born is to be born into a state of suffering, unhappiness. Because everyone that is born begins to grow old, begins to fall sick, and then die. That is not something that we like. What we call life 
is birth, aging, sickness and death. That's what we call life. So life is not a static thing. It's a dynamic process that begins with birth and ends in death. That is the problem. Now, just being aware of that is not enough. Because why should we become unhappy when we begin to grow old or fall sick or die? Why do people cry about it? Why do they lament? Why do they mourn? Why? Because people don't like to grow old. People don't like to fall sick. People don't like to die. They like birth. That means they like to exist. But that existence is simply an illusion. We are not really existing. Now when we speak about a wave, you think the wave exists? If you ask the question, does the wave exist? No, wave is simply a change in the surface of the water. But we think water exists. But if we really question to find out whether water exists, we will find that that is also a change. Everything that we think of is a process of change. The change may be a quick, fast change, or it could be a slow change. So when the change is slow, we begin to think that it is a real existence. That's the problem. Now the thing is, this unhappiness, when we see this reality of change, unhappiness is because of our emotions that want permanence in an impermanent world. It is our emotion which is blind. When people fall in love, they want eternal love. And then they are disappointed when they find that it is also impermanent. That's the problem. So we are most of the time carried away by our blind emotions. This is the problem. So the real cause of this unhappiness, this suffering, is not the change. It is the emotion that is blind. That emotion is what is called tanha, which is today translated in the wrong way as craving. So this craving is simply the emotional impulse that is blind. It is this same emotion that modern psychologists like Sigmund Freud was talking about. He was the one who started this thing called psychoanalysis and psychotherapy. And he was mainly dealing with emotions. Because we are born with this potential which is 
to be aroused by emotion and to be carried away by emotion. So when the child, the small child, is troubled by these emotions, there comes a problem. The problem is that the adults, like the father, mother, or uh, the older brothers or sisters, or whoever is looking after the baby, begin to say, don't do this, don't do that. That's not correct. Why? The small child is mainly dominated by these emotions. Like most animals, they are mainly controlled by emotions. So this ability to think and reason out and understand what is going on comes later as the child begins to grow. So now when these emotions come up like maybe anger or it may come up in the form of uh, desires for things, And when the older people begin to say, don't do that, then this child doesn't know how to deal with the emotion. So naturally, this emotion, when the child is not able to control it, will begin to forget about it, throw it out of the mind. That is what Freud saw as repression, what he called repression. And that begins to create all kinds of problems like uh, neurosis, psychosis, all these things begin to be based on this. So that itself is a suffering. Now some people say Buddhism is pessimistic, that Buddha has been talking about suffering, but what are the psychologists talking about today? <laughs> then they must also be pessimistic. You see, to talk about the problems of life, it's not pessimism. It is realism, trying to deal with real problems. What are these people who advertise all kinds of things begin to talk about? All these problems. Everything that they sell is simply a solution to a problem. If it is not a solution to a problem, people won't pay the money and buy it. So the important thing is that we have to learn to deal with these emotions which are blind. So what the Buddha pointed out was that if we want to be happy, we have to learn to deal with the emotions. This is what modern psychologists talk about also, dealing with emotions. But most of us think that the way to deal with emotions is to control the emotions. What is control? Our, we have two parts of the mind. One is the emotional part and the other is the thinking, reasoning part. 
So it is our thinking, reasoning part that is able to become aware of reality. This is what Freud called the ego. So the ego of Freud is, doesn't mean just a self. It is simply the rational faculty, the thinking part, the intellect. That's what Freud called the ego. It's not just the self. But why did he call it the ego? There was a reason. He was following an earlier philosopher, Descartes, who said, I think, therefore I am. He saw the mistake. He, he was a great philosopher in the sense that he began to doubt everything and questioned everything. But ultimately he came to one point even for me to question and doubt, I have to be thinking. Therefore, the only thing that I cannot doubt is that I am thinking. If I am thinking, then there must be me. So he thought, I think, therefore I am. But the mistake he made was, he started with, I think. If he started by saying, there is thinking, then he cannot come to the conclusion, I am. If he started with I, then naturally it has to end up with I. So, if he said, there is thought, then he cannot say, therefore I am. But because he said, I think, then that's not really a conclusion. He was just carrying what was at the beginning, what he assumed. It's an assumption that he carried. But of course at that time this was accepted as a truth. And so Freud also thought, the thinking was the ego. So that's why the thinking part was called the ego. And the emotional part, the feeling part, he called the id. Why? It simply means it. It's the Latin form of the English word it, it. It. Now, it is neuter gender. We refer to inanimate things as it. This is because he saw that the emotional arousal and the emotional behavior is a mechanical process. It just happens mechanically. Even the thinking part is happening mechanically. He didn't realize that. But he saw it to a great extent. Because he was a neurologist who knew how the brain and the nervous system works. So when he examined it, he saw that it was. But simply, in order to uh, identify a person, a personality, he had to use the word ego. Because whenever we, when someone does something, we can always ask a question, why did you do this? And what we ex expect is a rational answer. So, that rational 
part of the mind is responsible for answering that question and that he identified as the ego. Now if it is an emotional answer, we would say that was not a proper answer. Like a child, if a child uh, does something and you ask, why did you do this? The child might say, well, because I want to. That's all. There is no rational answer. But if you ask an adult, the same person, why did you do this? Even if it was emotional, that person will try to make it rational. And that is what is called rationalization. That you rationalize the emotion. And that rationalization itself is a method of repressing the emotion or forgetting about the emotion. So the important thing to understand is that we have two parts of the mind, the emotional part which the Buddha called chitta and the rational or thinking part is what the Buddha called mano, two words you. And today we have two words normally that we use. The thinking part we call the head. The feeling part we call the heart. So we speak of the head and the heart. But the problem is that this emotional part or the heart part comes in conflict with the thinking part. Because the thinking part is aware of the world and whatever is happening. But the feeling part is not aware of anything. It's simply feeling, that's all. I like it or I hate it. Whether it is rational or irrational, it doesn't matter. This is what it is doing, that Freud called it. So it's a matter of controlling the id. The ego is always trying to control the id. And if the ego is able to control the id properly, then that person will be a sane person, according to Freud. And if the person is unable to control the id, then that person is either neurotic or a psychotic. Now when we begin to see this, we begin to understand the importance of what the Buddha is trying to say. But even today, we find that people are not able to fully gain control of the emotions. This is the biggest problem. So the Buddha pointed out a way. There is a way of doing it. But very few modern psychologists care to look at Buddhism or the teaching of the Buddha. Partly because today the teaching of the Buddha is hidden. Because even the Buddhists themselves have lost touch with the original teachings. Today we have different schools of Buddhism that try to interpret the teachings of the Buddha in different ways. 
So when a non-Buddhist or a Westerner comes to study Buddhism, there is a problem. The Tibetan Buddhist will say, this is the teaching of the Buddha, to teach that. That is their dogma, is taught. The Chinese will say, no, no, that's not the real teaching of the Buddha. Our way is the real teaching of the Buddha. Or the Japanese will say, no, no, we have the real original teaching and teach that. Or maybe the Burmese will bring another point of view and say, this is the real teaching. Or the Sri Lankans will also come and say, well, that is not what it is. This is the teaching. So different schools of Buddhism begin to say different things. We have mainly three kinds of uh, Buddhism today. What is called Theravada, Mahayana, and Vajrayana. But they are all interpretations of the original teachings. That's not the original teaching. I, of course, was born in uh, Theravada country. But from my young days I began to question, is this the real teaching of the Buddha? Because I was a student of science and so I began to doubt some of the things that was taught as the teaching of the Buddha. So I began to find the original teaching. What is the original teaching of Buddha? I found that it was preserved by the Theravadins in the sutras. But they had commentators or commentaries written down explaining the sutras. And it is the commentaries that make the mistake. But people begin to blindly follow those things as a tradition. This is what is called traditionalism. People blindly follow traditions. So every culture is doing that. The Christians blindly follow the Christian Bible. The Jews uh, blindly follow the Jewish, uh, uh, what do you call that? Torah. Torah. Tor, huh? And uh, uh, Muslims blindly follow the Quran. And the Hindus blindly follow the Vedas. So the Buddhists blindly follow the what they call the Tripitaka. But even there, they are mainly following the commentaries and uh, what is called the Abhidha. But the real teaching is found in the early sutras. But there is a difficulty in getting at the sutra. The difficulty is the language. It's a dead language. So because it is a dead language, the meanings are lost because certain words have been getting into modern languages. Like for example, uh, the word nirvana. That was a word used by the Buddha, but it has become an English word also now. It's in the dictionary. So in a similar way, you have the words like karma, also similar word. But this happened in the Indian languages more. More words got into the Indian language, like even the word uh, Sinhalese in Sri Lanka or Hindi in India. 
So when these words have been picked up in the modern languages, the meaning of the word gradually begins to change. And when the meanings change, when they read the sutras, they begin to think, oh, that word means this. That means the meaning is different. So things like that happen. So it's a very difficult job to understand these things. So I have been struggling through many years to understand this. I don't say that I have discovered everything and uh, uh, I have found the real truth. But I would say that whatever I have found, I think it is correct. I may be wrong at the same time. So it's for, I can only share what I understand with you and you have to judge for yourself. There is one way that Buddhism can be uh, properly judged whether it is the original teaching or not because it is talking about a problem and its solution. And if the problem is solved by what I say or whatever you find, then you can say that is the real teaching of the Buddha. Because the Buddha is supposed to have solved the problem. So it's not just something, some dogma coming from one culture. It has to be uh, discovered. And every person has to discover this for himself or herself. That's the important thing. You cannot just uh, take it from another person because you have this doubt that the other person can be wrong. So, according to your level of maturity in your thinking, you will be able to understand the teaching of the Buddha. That's the important way to see it. And uh, when it is understood, you will find that your problem has been solved also. So it's the solution of the problem that is the, the real uh, test. That's why the Buddha said, just as a goldsmith will test what is given as gold, by a particular method and it is only by doing that that the person can really find out whether it is real gold or not. So in a similar way, when anyone speaks about the teachings of the Buddha, you should test it with your own experience as the crucible. Put it into that crucible and test it. So in a similar way, you should test what I say also. You should not take it blindly. So the important thing is that even before the Buddha, the problem was recognized by the Indian yogis, the Indian uh, mystics who had developed certain psychic powers and they became aware of this problem. And this problem was not a problem that was within this present life. It extended to many lives after death and many lives before death. This is the important thing. What we discussed last time was that we are being reborn 
again and again without end. We may be reborn not just as human beings. We can be reborn as animals also. Or we can be reborn in the health. In Buddhism, healths are there, but not exactly like the Christian or Jewish health. But the hell is there in the form of a pain world. And there are heavens also. And we can be reborn in the heavens also. Now, I said last time that the word transmite, oh, what's that? Uh, reincarnation is a wrong word to use. Because reincarnation means a soul being reincarnated, means a soul creeping into a body. That's not what is happening. And uh, even the word transmigration is not correct because that also involves a soul going from one life to another. Now in Buddhism we don't speak about the soul. There is no soul to speak about. But still, the rebirth takes place. It was very difficult to understand how that could happen. During the time of the Buddha, people found it difficult. But today, fortunately, If we understand modern science, a lot of things are happening in this way, which is uh, rebirth is happening all the time. Now when I speak and it is recorded in a tape recorder, and the voice comes back when you play back. That is a reproduction. You don't need the sword creeping from my mouth to the tape recorder and coming back. There is no such thing. Because everything in this world is an activity, not an entity. That's the important thing. There are no entities in the world. Entities are created in our mind. We think there are entities. Everything is an activity. But one activity can lead to another activity. So there can be a chain of activities. That's how rebirth takes place. It's simply a chain of activity. I am not an entity. When I use the word I, there is this illusion taking place. That is, I think there is an entity here called I, but there is no entity here. There is only activity. The whole body is an activity. You, you go and ask a doctor about it. You will see that the doctor will tell you that the whole body is simply a machine that is working. It's an activity going on. Even the thinking process is an activity that is going on. The feeling process is also an activity going on. And that activity can lead to another activity. So when we talk about uh, my voice being recorded or my voice being uh, carried away in the air and received somewhere else in a radio or even my picture being received somewhere else in a TV, it's the same thing, activity being transferred from one place to another. It's simply activity, it's simply a shaking, movement. That's all.
So if there are no entities in the world, then it's very easy to understand what we mean by rebirth. Even when we speak about a wave in the water, it's simply an activity. The water rising and falling, come, come going up, coming down, that's all. When the water at this point starts going up and down, the water next to that also starts going up and down. Then the water next to that also goes, but we see it as something going like that, but there is nothing going like that. It's only how we see it. So this is the important thing. All movement is actually, ultimately, another concept that we have observed and we have formed a concept. We, we, we are all, all the time observing things and inferring. Observation and infer. That's all that we have. Observation and infer. So when we begin to think like that, we have this problem That is that we think we are living, we, but we are born, we begin to grow old, we fall sick and die. That is also an activity, that's all that's going on. But we become attached to this thing that doesn't really exist, which is the entity. The entity is the self. And we think that there is this entity which is growing old, falling sick and dying. And then we ask, where did this entity go? All this time there was an entity here talking to me and uh, I was talking to the entity and the entity was <laughs> answering me. But now it suddenly stopped. <laughs> what happened? Where did this entity go? This is why when someone during the time of the Buddha asked this question, the Buddha said, well, if there is a fire here and then the fire goes out and I ask you the question, where did this fire go? How do you answer? And that man said, well, when the fire has gone out, it has not gone anywhere. What has really happened is that there was were, there were some firewood here which was burning and when the firewood uh, disappeared and burnt off, then the fire disappeared. So he said, in the same way, this is what is happening to you. There is no person here or any entity that has to go. It simply comes to an end. But that activity can lead to another activity. This is the problem. So, in any case, after the Buddha's awakening from this dream of existence, so existence is just seen as a dream from which we have to awaken. And once we awaken, we will realize that there is no existence. But after he became awakened, there is a verse that is supposed to have been a statement of the Buddha. It's very interesting. Aneka jati sansara Sandha Vishan Anibhishan. I have been traveling in this sansara, sansara in this chain of free births. I have been going from life to life in this sansara. Gahakarakan Gave Santo. Gahakarakan Gave Santo means going in search of the Creator. 
Now some people say the Buddha never spoke about the Creator. That's not true. It's all in the sutras. Here it says, I have been searching for this Creator. Gahakar really means the builder of the house. The builder of the house is simply the Creator. So I have been going in search of this Creator, but I never met Him. I never met this Creator. It is very painful to be born again and again. Dukkha jati punak puna, which means to be born again and again is very painful. That was the first verse. Now that is thinking in the ordinary way. And then the second verse he says, Gahakaraka Dittosi, I have seen you Creator. The second verse is, I have seen you Creator. You will not create anymore. All your creations have been destroyed. All the supports have been broken down. Visankara Gatan Chitta. The mind, the chitta, has stopped creating. Tanha and Khaya that emotional urge has disappeared. Who is the creator? It is that emotional urge that is created. The blind emotion is doing all the creation. But the blind emotion is doing it along with the thinking part. It's not only the emotion that is doing it, because it is the thinking part that leads to the emotional excitement. And then the emotional excitement combines with the thinking part to create the whole world and including yourself. That was the awakening. That was the awakening from this dream of existence. He saw that the whole existence is a creation of the mind. That's the important thing. So this is what I call a paradigm shift. You know, someone wrote a book about how science is progressing. Every time science progresses, there is a paradigm shift taking place. Even in philosophical thinking, if you study the history of Western philosophy, you will find that paradigm shifts are taking place, always changing of concepts going on. There is one very important paradigm shift in Western philosophy that took place which is very significant in understanding the teaching of the Buddha. This was done in England by three philosophers. One was Locke, the other was Berkeley, the other was Hume. It's very important, these three people. Locke was a person who started saying that 
there is no such thing as a mind. People think there, is a, there are two entities. One entity is the body, the other entity is the mind. It was this illusion that has created a lot of problems even in psychology. Locke pointed out what we have is the brain and the nervous system. There is no mind here. It's the activity of the brain and the nervous system that we call the mind. It's like the engine of a car. When the engine begins to work, the car begins to move. And when the engine stops working, the car stops moving. So the movement is not created by a separate entity. It's simply the activity of this machine. So in a similar way, the mind, what we call the mind, is simply the activity of the brain and the nervous system, which is the body. Now this other philosopher, Berkeley, he was a bishop, he was a Christian, he didn't like this idea because he wanted God somewhere. So, <laughs> so because he wanted that, so he wanted to find out a different way of uh, attacking this. So he said, no, you are completely wrong. It's not correct. Because you are talking about matter. And there is only matter in the world. There is no mind. But what is it that you call matter? What you call matter is produced by this process of perception. When you open your eyes, you see something. Or you can hear a sound, or smell, or taste, or touch. And you touch something and say, this is hard, piece of iron or something. You can say this is very hard and you can see with your eyes. But ultimately it is simply a picture in your mind. So what you call matter is a picture in the mind. So how can you have a picture in the mind if there is no mind? So what you find in this world is only mind. There is no such thing as matter. He said. That is also true. Sure. You can't defeat that argument. So one man asked, well, if there is a tree in a forest which you have never seen, but there is a tree in a forest you have not seen, and that tree falls, breaks and falls, who sees that? No one has seen this tree. Who sees that? If everything is in the mind, then there must be a mind that sees that. Then he said, he, he, he thought about this. He can't give a stupid answer. So he said, that is in the mind of God. God sees. So, uh, 
he got something for God also then. So, <laughs> but of course, uh, there, there came another philosopher, and that was Hume. He came and said, you are both wrong. <coughs> Berkeley, uh, B, uh, uh, this, uh, Locke proved to you that there is no such thing as mind. And uh, Berkeley proved that there is no such thing as matter. That means there is no mind, there is no matter. Then what is there? There is only, we can only speak of one thing, that is sense experience. That is all that we can talk about, sense experience. That's all there is. Then, of course, came another philosopher, uh, Immanuel Kant. He was the one who started going into a more detailed description of this. And then he spoke of two things called the phenomena and the noumena. He said, yes, what we what Hume said is correct. So Whatever we have perceived through the senses, what we experience is what is called the phenomenon. But there must be something outside there which we can't really directly know. Because we are limited by our senses. And because we are limited by our senses, we can know and talk about only what we have perceived, which is the phenomenon. But there must be something outside there, which is producing this. And that is what we call the noumenon, which people cannot know. So he went on a different direction and then of course there was another philosopher who started saying, well, that noumenon can be known. It can be known through extrasensory perception by mystics. Mystics can know it and that is God. So like that. Of course, the later philosophers started questioning that also and rejected that. You cannot talk about anything outside your sense experience. Even the extrasensory perception is a kind of perception. And therefore, it is all sensory perception. So, when we come to the Buddha, the Buddha said the same thing that Hume saw which is, Buddha says in one of the sutras, this is the all. What is the all? The eye and what is seen, the ear and what is heard, the nose and what is smelled, the tongue and what is tasted, the body and what is touched, and the thinking process. If a person says, I will talk to you about something other than this, he can be questioned or cross-questioned and ultimately he will not be able to make good his boast. So in other words, we can talk about only this 
and that is what the Buddha called Dhamma or Dharma. This is the important thing to understand. The word Dharma, some writers say this word Dharma cannot be defined properly because it, it takes different meanings and in different contexts, different meanings, but that is not true. There is only one meaning. When a Buddha used the word, he had only one meaning for that. And people who don't understand that meaning begin to hide their ignorance by saying that uh, there he meant one thing, another place he meant another thing. Why should the intelligent person do things like that? Normally people do things in their conversation, but a scientist will always use one word to mean one thing one word like energy or force or power, every word will be defined. The philosophers also do that. So why should the Buddha start using different words? That's not correct. He had only one meaning, which is this experience, sense experience. That was the Dhamma. But the word Dhamma means that which bears, that's the important thing, that which bears. What does that mean? That means the ground of being, the ground of being that people talk about, the ground of existence. The ultimate ground on which everything rests, and that is this sense experience. This is what people are unable to see. This is why some people say the ground of being is existence, or the ground of being is God. All kinds of people begin to say that, but the ground of being, the Buddha points out, is this sense experience. That is why it is called Dharma. Dharma means the ground of being. In other words, normally people think, I exist, I exist in the world, the world exists, I exist and I come and see the world. Or if I take an object like say this this uh, temple or whatever you call it, Vihar or monastery is existing and you have been existing somewhere in your home and then you come here and see the Vihar. Or you see me, I have been existing and you have been existing and you come and see me. Right? So in other words, we are talking about a subject that is yourself and an object, what you see. So the subject exists the object exists and then the subject sees the object. Right? This is how people think. In other words, existence precedes experience. Right? That's what people think, that existence precedes experience. Existence comes first, then comes experience. But what the Buddha is pointing out is, experience comes first, then comes existence. This is the difference. 
experience comes first. Means you see. It is in the seeing that you think of a subject that sees and an object that is being seen. If there was no seeing, then there would be no subject or object. Right? That's the important thing. That is how the experience becomes the Dhamma. The existence has been called Bhava. The word that the Buddha used for existence is Bhava. And Bhava Nirodo Nibbana. So he defines Nibbana. Is the, the the cessation of existence is Nibbana. Or the freedom from existence is Nibbana. or liberation from existence is Nibbāna. This is the important thing to understand. So when we talk about Nibbāna, we are talking about a complete transformation of our way of thinking. This is a paradigm shift. It is only when we have changed our way of thinking that we cease to be carried away by blind emotions. It is this existence that brings about this emotional arousal. young man walking on the road sees the nice looking girl you see. and you see I am here there is that nice sexy girl there and then the emotion is aroused all that is coming from existence you are thinking in terms of existence but if you see if you can look at this whole process of perception and conception as an activity that is simply going on, is an impersonal process. There is no personality here. There is no person there, there is no person here. It's an impersonal process that is going on. And you become free of that e e impersonal process. You are not carried away by that. Then all passion, lust, anger, hatred, worries, anxieties, all that disappears. And your mind is calm and tranquil. It is this disturbance of the, what we call the mind that is creating the whole problem. The original state of the mind is a calm, tranquil state. The mind is tranquil in the original form. It gets disturbed by seeing things, hearing things, smelling things, tasting things, touching things, and thinking about things. The mind gets disturbed. But if we can stop that disturbed. The mind becomes tranquil. The mind is actually trying to come back to this original state of calm all the time. All the time it is trying to come back to the original state. 
This is something that Freud himself saw. Freud also saw this. He spoke about it. If you read some of the books written by Freud, you'll see that. He talks about this. But still he never saw Nirvana properly. Because he saw the problem, the conflict, but he thought that these emotions cannot be got rid of. That's why he called them instincts. <coughs> he called them instincts. We are born with it. We can't do anything about it other than find some kind of satisfaction, some way of gratifying the emotion. And the solution to the problem that he found was what he calls sublimation, which is to gratify the emotions in a socially acceptable way. If your emotions are coming in the form of uh, sexual desires, the only way is to, socially acceptable way is to get married and have a family. Any other way is not socially acceptable. But of course today you have other kinds of uh, marriage which is acceptable. That's in the modern world after Freud. But at that time the only way was that. Or in the other way is if you become angry, you want to kill a person or to take revenge on a person. How can you do it in the socially acceptable way? Go to courts, file action. That's the only way you could take revenge. Now they say uh, revenge is a wild form of justice. But actually justice is a glorified form of revenge. So, so this is the point that uh, he saw only this because he believed in this thing called instincts which cannot be got rid of. So only way is to gratify the emotions in a socially acceptable way and so you become a normal person instead of an abnormal person. So his method was always to bring abnormal people to a normal state. But the Buddha's method was something more than that. His method was not so much to bring abnormal people to the normal state, but to bring normal people to a supernormal state. And that supernormal state is where the emotions are completely got rid of and the mind stays calm all the time. The unshakable mind, that's the important thing. That is, of course, the ordinary people are the normal people. They are not able to achieve this suddenly, but through a gradual process which can take many lives depending on the person's uh, level of maturity or what we call emotional maturity and intellectual maturity. It's the emotion and the intellect that is important here. So the head and the heart. So the maturity of the head and the heart. 
According to that maturity, you can do it this, in this life or maybe in the next life or maybe many lives after. Everything depends on where you are now. But the important thing is to learn to gain control over this emotional impulse. This is the main thing. And to gain control over the emotional impulse, we have to learn that the emotional impulse starts with the thinking process. Now today there is a form of psychology called cognitive psychology. And this cognitive psychology, they have understood this point that the cognitive part, which is the intellectual part, the thinking part, determines the arousal of the emotion. And so, it is by changing the cognitive part that we can change the emotional part. This is why what is called the Noble Eightfold Path of the Buddha begins with right understanding. This is the important thing, that the thinking part has to be changed. It's only when the thinking part is changed that the feeling part becomes changed. And the feeling part is goal-oriented. This is the important thing to understand. It's always seeking a goal. Either it is seeking pressure or it is trying to avoid pain. This is what the emotion is doing all the time, either seeking pressure or avoiding pain. This is what Freud saw as the id. The id is dominated by the pleasure principle, that's what he said. The pleasure principle is to see pleasure and avoid pain. So when we have understood the problem and its solution, then we begin to move in the right direction, which is the original state of tranquility. So tranquility becomes the goal in life. If tranquility becomes the goal, because unconsciously we are all the time seeking tranquility. That's why people say, I want peace of mind. I don't like to get disturbed. But it has to be consciously directed. So we have to understand that our main goal in life should be tranquility of mind. So. What this means is, these emotions are not instincts, not built inside. The emotion is simply a disturbance of the mind. Original state, it was calm, and this calmness has been disturbed. <coughs> so it has to come back to the original state. So there is nothing unnatural about it. This is a natural, the most natural thing is to come back to the original state. There is a word in uh, uh, biological thinking which is called homeostasis. That homeostasis, normally people speak about it when we speak about, say, uh, the healing of a wound. Now, if you are, if your uh, leg breaks or your hand uh, gets cut, there is this tendency 
of the body to come back to the original state, which is the healing process. But this healing process is prevented by something. What is that? The bacteria. The bacteria come and start working on this. So, when the, so it's not the doctor who does the healing. What the doctor is doing is only preventing the bacteria attacking the wound. So even a sickness inside the body happens in the same way. So there are other organisms trying to prevent the healing process in the body other than the bacteria. What's that? There is the virus. Virus is another kind of thing that prevents the healing. So this is how it works. So this natural process of healing or coming back to the original state is found not only in the body, but the mental process is also doing the same thing. It is always trying to return to the original state of tranquility. But again, like the bacteria, there is something that begins to prevent this. And this is simply the disturbance of the mind due to environmental stimulation. Things happening in the environment begin to disturb the mind. So what the Buddha points out is there is one way to get rid of that. And that is what the Buddha calls guarding the senses. Indriya Sangvar is a word that the Buddha used. Indriya means the senses. Sangvara means to guard. Guarding the senses. It's like a boxer. When the other person tries to hit you, you hold the arm and stop that. As guarding. So in a similar way, when a stimulation takes place from outside, you have to have the guard to protect. And that guard, guard is simply awareness of what is going on. That awareness is what is called sati. Today, be, that word sati is wrongly translated as mindfulness. It's not just mindfulness. I call it attention. You have to be attentive all the time to what is going on. So gradual focusing of attention, that is very important. have to pay attention to whatever is happening. Every time you see an object, you have to become aware of seeing. Is any <coughs> disturbance taking place? And so this is why the Buddha says, when you see something, don't think about the pleasantness or the unpleasantness of what you see. If you think about the pleasantness of what you see, you become attracted to it. If you think about the unpleasantness of what you see, you are repelled. You begin to hate what you see. These are the two basic emotions. 
the lust and the hate. And that could be stopped only by guarding the senses. Now when you do guarding the senses and practice it properly, you be able to somehow gain control over that process. But there is something else happening. Thoughts come from the memory. What happened in the past comes into your mind. You have to be able to get rid of that also. And again you have to pay attention to that. You have to be aware. And then do, do the same thing, not to be thinking of the pleasantness of this memory or the unpleasantness of the memory. You have to be able to throw it out of your mind. So this can come to you constantly. Every time it comes, you throw it out. And if you keep on doing that, it will stop coming. It's like uh, visitors coming to your house. Someone knocks on the door. You open the door and you find a person that you don't like to receive. So you can just talk about the unpleasantness of that, like the, uh, I don't like you. Huh? <laughs> don't come in. Then that person will go away. If you do that every time that person comes, it might be that the person comes several times. Every time the person comes, you can say that. And then the person will gradually stop coming. So in a similar way, when the thought comes to your mind, you have to do the same thing. When the thought comes, oh, I don't like you, I don't want you here. This is why Christian speaks about this in a different way. They say, let God come in to you. Don't let the devil come in. When the devil comes, throw it out. When God comes, you receive. You take the God in. God simply is what is good. The devil is what is evil. So from a Buddhist point of view, God and devil simply means good and evil. That's all. From good you take one O out, then you'll have God. From the devil you take, put one D into it, it becomes evil. I mean, um, from the devil you, you yeah. <laughs> so it's the same thing. The important thing is to learn to watch what is happening. This is the meaning of sati. And we have this word satipatthana. Satipatthana is also usually translated as mindfulness. But satipatthana is sati upatthana. Upa means inside. Sati is attention. Attention focused inside. Not attention focused outside. This is the important thing. When, when I look outside, I see something nice and I think about, oh, how nice it is, then the desire comes. But instead of doing that, instead of focusing my attention on that object, 
I begin to focus my attention on the reaction to the object. Here a desire rose in my mind and now I look at the desire instead of looking at the object. The moment I do that, the desire disappears. Why? Because the desire is aroused only because I am focusing on that object. When I stop focusing on the object, the desire cannot arise, so it disappears. That's how it goes. But there is a problem here. The problem is the desire is not just a mental thought. It's a physical change. Because when the desire rises, a message goes to the glands and the hormone is secreted into the blood and this hormone goes to various parts of the body and creates changes in the body. So it's a complete physical thing, not just a mental thought. And therefore, even when you take your mind away from the object and focus on the thought, it doesn't disappear at once. It's like the hot plate, you switch it off, it doesn't become cool at once. You have to wait till it gradually cools down. So in the same way, when the emotion is aroused and you take your attention away from the object and focus on the emotion, it doesn't disappear at once. And if you become impatient, then again, that becomes another emotion. So instead of that, you have to relax and just wait, watch, and gradually you will find it cools down. So that's the important thing to understand. So it's a very simple matter. Take your attention away from the object, focus on the reaction to the object. Just be aware of it, that's all. And this is what we call meditation. So meditation is not just sitting like a statue. The important thing in meditation is the mind, not the body. So it is something that you have to be doing all the time, not just once a day or twice a day or even thrice a day, all the time you have to be watching what is going on. We'll be discussing this part gradually next time, the practical part. But today we discuss the about Nirvana. I hope you understood. But if you didn't understand, here is the time to ask questions. So you can ask questions and we can discuss them. this attention, uh, this consciousness, uh, this awareness. Um, if I understood you earlier in the, the lecture that um, there's nothing, hmm? uh, existence, when, we were to, when you were talking about existence. Well, who, so who or what is directing, uh, guarding um, consciousness, uh, uh, attention, yeah, that's a good question. Thank you. Only thing is that the moment you talk about the who, mm -hmm. 
you are talking about the subject. Mm. So we cancel the subject and the object. Mm. <laughs> there is only the action part. There is really no subject or object. It's the experience. And it's the experience that is creating the subject and the object. So, we can talk about seeing, but we cannot talk about who sees or what is being seen. There is only the seeing. So this is why in uh, this vipassana meditation, sometimes these vipassana teachers talk about that. There is a story where some person uh, was taught in a, in a simple way, in a very short way, how to practice vipassana. And he said, in the seeing, there is only the seeing. In the hearing, there is only the hearing. In the smelling, there is only the smelling. In the tasting, there is only the tasting. In the touching, there is only the touching. What it means is there is no subject or object. There is only the experience. That's the important thing. So all that comes really through the meditation process. You begin to understand it fully. Now you can only think, but our thinking is also uh, going on in the normal way, which is the normal paradigm. So we have to come out of that paradigm and to get into a different paradigm where we begin to think in a different way. Now this is what the Buddha was trying to Say in that verse, two verses that I spoke of. Earlier he was talking about traveling in sansara, looking for the Creator. There he is assuming the existence of a person going from life to life and that there is some person who is doing the creation. And then in the second verse he says, I have seen you Creator. Ultimately, that creator is his own mind itself, which is doing the creating. There is no creator outside. It's the mental process itself that is doing the creation. That process of perception, seeing, hearing, smelling. Now, if you read the modern book on psychology, one of these uh, textbooks that people use uh, in studying psychology in universities. There is a chapter on perception. If you read that chapter, you will begin to understand how your mind is creating. Modern people have understood this fully. But that understanding has not been uh, assimilate properly. This is what is happening. It has to get into your life. That's very important. This is why the meditation process the meditation process is a method of getting that into your life. The, the whole Noble Eightfold Path starts with Samaditti, which is the right understanding. But that doesn't end there. That is the enlightenment that I spoke of. The right understanding will be the enlightenment. But that's not enough. 
that has to enter your life, your thinking, your speaking, your action, your living. That's how it works. Any other questions? The more you ask questions, the more you will understand. <laughs> yeah? Can you explain a little more about, um, a little more about emotions being a mechanical process of all of this happening to you? Um, it makes me think of dependent origination, the cause and effect. Um, starting with stimuli entering the sense gates, and then you have yeah. an emotional reaction that yeah. basically happens to you, and it's like an impersonal process. If you could just explain a little more about Well, good. That's a good question. Something that uh, I didn't explain enough, I suppose. The important thing to understand that. I have a method of explaining this. First, we start with an assumption, uh, because we have to start somewhere. So we start by saying that we are not people here. We are organisms, that's all. When we speak of an organism, we are speaking of something like a machine, uh, a biological machine is called an organism. Uh, a machine uh, made of, uh, made by people uh, is of course called a machine. But what the machines that are formed automatically through the biological process is called an organism. So, as an organism, we have five senses, the eyes, the ears, the nose, the tongue and the body. And of course, there is the brain which is doing the uh, thinking uh, process and perception, brain and nervous system. Now when these senses are stimulated, like some electromagnetic wave coming and falling on the eye, like what, what we call light. Light is not uh, what we really think of. It is an electromagnetic wave that comes and falls on the eye. And then that stimulates the retina in the eye, what is called the retina, I hope you know, which is the back, uh, some thing at the back of the eyeball. Huh? And the nerve, uh, there is a nerve, what is called the optic nerve, that goes to the brain. And the nerve impulse goes like a uh, uh, like in a telephone, uh, a zero impulse goes to the brain and then you see. You see colors, you see shapes, so those are the things that you see. Then of course, in the brain you begin to uh, create concepts. Now first what you see is simply what you might call a percept or a sensation. And then you begin to think about it, interpret what you have seen. You form concepts. And according to how you interpret, the, the message is sent to the glands. And, of course, the glands begin to secrete hormones and then an emotional arousal takes place. That's how the emotional arousal 
according to how you interpret. Now, if a person comes here and begins to say something, you might interpret that as a joke. If you interpret that as a joke, then you begin to laugh. If you interpret that as an insult, then you become angry. If you interpret that as a threat, you might get frightened. So the kind of emotion that is aroused depends on your interpretation. And once the emotion is aroused, the body gets ready to act. And tension arises in the body. And that tension makes you uncomfortable. Till the tension is released in action. So you release the tension to obtain what you desire or to get rid of what you hate or to run away from what you fear. And if you can't do any of those things, you start crying and lamenting. Huh? So that whole emotional arousal and the action is a the reaction. It's the reaction to the stimulus. The organism is reacting to the stimulus. That's all that is happening. So that is in short how the emotion arouse, is aroused. So if you can learn to stop that, that's what the Buddha taught. How to stop that? If you can learn to stop that, you you remain calm. You won't be disturbed. But today what has happened is you don't know how to stop it. So it happens to you and when it happens to you, you think you have done it. Say, when you are angry, you think, ah, I am angry, as if you have done the anger. And when you begin to fall in love or something, you think, I have fallen in love, as if you did it. You have not done anything, it's just happening to you. You are just working like a machine, that's all. So if you can see this, see it as an impersonal process. There is no self involved in this whole thing. Then the power is lost. It's your personalizing this that gives power to it. Thank you uh, for your talk. It was very, I got a lot out of it. Mm -hmm. Just now you're talking about um, a stimulus coming into the sensory perceptual process and we react to that stimulus. Part of that reaction, I think, I, I guess I should say, my, my understanding of part of that reaction is internal because we have, probably as a result of prior learning, and this is what I think gives us the sense that I am, is this, this prior learning, you spoke of memory, a building up of our experiences with that particular stimulus, so that when the stimulus comes in, part of what causes us to label it and respond to it as a threat or as a joy, or whatever have you, is something that we have encoded 
And that, as I'm sure you're aware, neuroscientists have now determined also occurs at the level of the neurons, that there are actually changes that go on in, in that cascade of processes that you talked about in the brain, in the neuron. As we experience the world and as we learn, those processes do change the brain just as the physical body can act upon the world. That physical world acts upon actually the brain as we learn. So I guess what I'm asking is how does one um, become impersonal when there's both a response to something that's external as well as a response to something internal? That's part one of my question. Yeah, good. That's a good question. <laughs> See, I will answer that Thank question. You. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the important thing is that uh, what you said is very important, something that I didn't mention. So this is why asking questions is very important because there are some places where I have not really come out with the details, then I am able to come out with it. Every time we form a concept, we are bringing the past into it. This is important to understand. Whenever we look at an apple and say, this is an apple, we are bringing the past memory into it. We have seen apples before. And so we are putting this new apple that I see, I put into that same category and call it apple. So in a similar way, if we have been having past experiences of different kinds, even as a child, we begin to bring in that to the present and we interpret the present in terms of our past experience. This is what Freud saw. This is the meaning of Freud's psychoanalysis, which is to recall the past and see the connection between the past incident and the present experience. So this is what uh, I think what you call coming from inside, what is internal. So there is that internal factor as well as the external factor that produces this new experience. Is that uh, what you asked? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I haven't I haven't really put this together yet, so I don't know if it's going to make sense. Um, yeah. From parts of what you were saying, I, I I really got a lot out of your description of um, the fact that basically all there is is action. I that's in my experience that's what I what I believe, and that was very helpful. Uh, that's going to be very helpful for me in meditation in particular. I was thinking about something you said about justice being a glorified form of revenge. Yeah. And I was thinking about the concept of karma attached with the concept of action. And you talked a lot about how some of these words have not been translated properly and how we may not understand what they truly meant. So my understanding of karma was always that um, if I engaged in certain actions, you know, like good actions, that at some later point, you know, some good result would occur. And if I engaged in some, you know, bad actions or evil actions, at some later point, something evil would occur. But based on what you're saying, I think that's extremely simplistic. And so I was thinking about how if there's a, there's just a series of, of a chain of activity. Uh, in, in myself and all other non-entities uh, that, that interact, then if, if one entity interacts with another entity in a way, or when one chain of activity interacts with another chain of activity in a way that is, um, that may be perceived as an injustice, are, are you then saying that that interaction itself is 
not, how should I put this, something that's a part of a meaningful faith, but is maybe more just of a random <coughs> occurrence, uh, and that we produce the meaningful fate out of the way that we respond to it, and then that becomes whatever the perhaps karmic, maybe that's not what we look at it, but consequences of that uh, that occurrence, that interaction. Well, I, I, I don't know if I'm, as I said, I haven't totally thought this through, but do you no, oh, I think uh, I understand what you said. This is something that uh, we discussed earlier oh. when we were talking about karma. You were not here. Correct. Uh, the important thing is today people think karma is some kind of uh, law of punishment and reward similar to God punishing and rewarding people. But karma is not a thing like that. There is no punishment and reward in karma. It's like uh, you drive in the wrong way and then you meet with an accident. Now the accident is not a punishment. But if the police catch you and uh, take you to courts, then of course you will get a punishment. So punishment is always given by people. But these are all like inanimate things and uh, everything in the world is really inanimate in that sense. Even what we call animate are also inanimate. So that there is no punishment and reward or judges in the world. Everything happens due to the presence of the necessary conditions. When the necessary conditions are there, something occurs. And that is how karma works. It doesn't work like uh, someone judging and then punishing. So this is, if you begin to understand it that way, I suppose your problem will be, uh, will disappear, huh? Did you understand that? Yes. So did you find that uh, your question was answered or not answered? I, I think that your comment is very helpful. I, I pretty much probably didn't really have a question with more just sort of muddling through ideas uh -huh. that came about what you were talking and your clarification was very helpful. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? No more questions. Huh? Uh -huh. One back here. Monty, I thank you for your talk. I uh, have all, had a problem uh, understanding um, the concept of delusion, and I noticed when you were talking about um, when, when you re uh, covered the Khaleesas, you seemed like you only talked about the wanting and the uh, aversion. Uh, part of it, I, I didn't hear you talk about delusion in that. You just mentioned the other two, and I was just wondering why, and could you explain for me um, the concept of delusion, because I I'm just have a, had a lot of trouble with that. Okay. That's also a good question. Uh, the Buddha spoke of three things. 
that uh, determine our behavior and our actions. Loba, dosa and moha. Loba refers to uh, desires for things or the passion or the lust. That is loba. Dosa refers to the aversion or the hatred of things, which is really loba is the desire for the pleasant things, and dosa is the hatred of the unpleasant. Now he spoke of a third thing called moha. Now the moha refers to the blindness of these emotions. It's not only that the emotion is blind, the emotion prevents you from thinking in the proper way. So I spoke of two parts of the mind. One is the emotional part and the other the thinking part. Now the emotional part, when the emotion is aroused, the thinking part is unable to think properly. This is the problem. And that is what we call moha. Moha is the inability to form proper concepts. And so we begin to often rationalize the emotion. So in other words, when emotion and reason are in conflict, what happens? Emotion always wins. This is what happens. The emotion becomes dominant and the reason begins to uh, obey the emotion or begin to interpret the emotion in a rational way and point out that what I did was right. Huh? You might be angry and you kill a person and then you rationalize and say, well, I did the right thing. I had to kill the person. You might say that person tried to kill me. Now this is why Dale Carnegie in his book How to Win Friends and Influence People. It's a very interesting book you should read if you have not read that. There he points out, he was talking about uh, some uh, uh, criminal in ancient uh, United States, Al Capone. You may have heard this. <coughs> he says a man, uh, uh, he was driving and a policeman stopped him and asked for the license. And he took his pistol or revolver and shot him. And it was later that he was caught somehow and he was taken to prison. And uh, so what happened was, he says, this is what I do for uh, my, my heart is uh, uh, very uh, kind and compassionate and this is what I get for being so. You see something like that where he, he never uh, admits that he, uh, he has done something wrong. He is always defending himself and he is trying to show that he was a good person. 
So this is very important to understand that uh, when emotion and reason are in conflict, emotion uh, becomes powerful and dominant and the reason becomes a slave to the emotion. And this is why people fight, this is why there are wars in the world, this is why there is crime in the world, because people's emotions become dominant. And so they destroy things, all this destruction all the destructive things happening in the world, all that is due to the emotions dominating reason. And, uh, but at the same time today people always trying to def def defend emotion. They say if, if, if we take off emotions, uh, will be like uh, inanimate things. That's what people try to say. They are so much attached to the emotions. But if you study uh, the biological theory of evolution, you will begin to understand that before the brain was properly evolved, the animals were mainly uh, guarded and protected by emotions. That is true. But once the human being gets a better brain and the ability to think and reason out, those emotions are unnecessary. The emotions can be removed completely and reason alone can do what emotions were doing in the wrong way. Now if you see these uh, movies uh, by, uh, uh, what's that, uh, movie channel where you get animals all the time? Huh? Yeah. What? Animal Planet? No, no, no. <coughs> discovery. Discovery, that's right. The Discovery Channel. There you get uh, tigers or lions chasing after uh, animals and catching them and killing them. But the animals are running because of the emotion. They get frightened and they run. But they don't ex escape really because this uh, other animal who can run better can catch them and eat them. So that emotion didn't really help them. <laughs> <You see? laughs> but if that animal had intelligence, the animal could have uh, found a way of escape. You see? So intelligence is more powerful than emotion. Emotion has been helpful in protecting lives in some animals, but not altogether, but at least it has been helpful in some way. But if the animals had intelligence, they would have been doing much better. Now, human being is a very small animal. We have to understand that human being is very small compared to the elephant. But the human being with that intelligence is able to do better than the elephant and the human being can control the elephant and get things done by the elephant. Although he has a big body, maybe even the size of the brain may be bigger than the size of the human being, but still the human being's brain is more evolved. 
think and can think and do things better than the animals. So what is important for the human being is to become fully human. We are only half human because we are being carried away by the emotion. We are not fully human. So the aim of the teaching of the Buddha is really to become fully human. By getting rid of these emotions which are blind and misleading, we can use our intelligence. Now some people say, if we don't have emotions, we'll have no love. That is again a mistake. There is this uh, psychologist, Eric Fromm, who wrote a book called The Art of Loving. If you read that book, you will find that he is able to distinguish between three kinds of love. He says the English word love is uh, confusing. It is not really uh, uh, very clear what is meant by love. Some people call sexual activities also love. They, to talk about sexual intercourse, they say making love. So, what is love? Now, he says there are three kinds of love. One is erot erosis or erotic love. Eros, which is a Greek word. And then there is family love, where is love between mother and children and between brothers and sisters, which is a different kind of love, which is not sexual love. And that he calls philia. And then there is another kind of love where when, when Jesus says, love thy neighbor as thyself. He's not talking about erotic love or even family love. He's talking about a, a kindness and compassion. That is what he called agape, a Greek word again. So when the Buddhists talk about metta or maitri, the Buddhists are also talking about this selfless love or um, I translate this as universal benevolence or goodwill, universal goodwill, which is an interest in the welfare of all beings not only human beings, all beings, even animals and even inanimate plants and life of any kind. So that is universal love or universal uh, benevolence. So that is that kind of universal concern for the welfare of all beings is not an emotion. This is the important thing. Because all emotions are self-centered. It is only when our mind is free of these self-centered emotions that we are really able to become interested in the welfare of others. That's the <laughs> important thing to understand. So only when the mind is free of this lobe, dose and moha, the lust, hate and the delusion, which is the delusion, main delusion is to think, I am. That is created by these self-centered emotions. The self-centered emotions, because they are self-centered, the center is the self. So the concept of self is also born out of this emotion which is self-centered. 
the self and the other. And so when the mind is free of these emotions, we become selfless and we become selfless concerned about the welfare of all beings, not just one person or just our family or just our nation, but all beings, not even just human beings, all beings. That is possible only when our mind is free of these self-centered emotions. And therefore this love, selfless love is not an emotion, it's a calm, tranquil state of the mind. Is that okay? <laughs> so now I think uh, it's almost six thirty. So we'll uh, stop here, and uh, so we are coming to the end of our series of talks. But we have this other talk also, but we can continue and if you are interested uh, till I uh, stay here. And uh, the important thing is we will be talking next time more on the practical part, like the Noble Eightfold Path, huh? about uh, the the practice of the teaching of the Buddha and uh, how it can be done. So today it was more on the theoretical aspect. Huh? Mm -hmm. so, so you know the goal of the Buddhist which is Nibbana, which is to return to the original state of calm and stay there so that the mind can never be disturbed. That is a very high goal, but <laughs> uh, you don't have to be discouraged if you are not able to attain that high state at once. But it can take many lives, not only one life. But if, if you try this life, you'll be able to get into a better position in the next life. And if you don't try it and if you ignore the whole thing, you might go down further in the next life. So this is why it is very important to be practicing this in this life, in fact, not to be postponing. <coughs> mm. Okay, I will end up by chanting a uh, Blessing to bring you good health, happiness and success in everything that you do. And put your hands together like this, arms together. Bhavatu sabba mangalam rakkandu sabba devata 